morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the draft National Labor Migration Policy. We are looking at this policy from an employment and immigration perspective. My name is Talita, and I would like to run through a few housekeeping matters with you, which hopefully will enhance this experience for you all. As participants, you are automatically muted and the chat functionality has been disabled. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please make use of the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. The questions will come to me and I can then direct them to the appropriate panelist. Um, we will not be able to provide written responses to questions and we might not be able to deal with all of the, the questions asked, but we will try to deal with most of, of what is asked. This webinar is being recorded and a copy will be available on our website later today. So firstly, if I can introduce our panelists, we have Chris Waters, a special guest, um, an independent immigration attorney. And Chris, we are very grateful for your participation today. Um, it is great to see you. We also have Ross Day, who is a partner in our employment department. Um, Ross is very uh, skilled attorney, both from a litigation and advisory perspective. And thank you very much, Ross, for your participation. Zawadi Kamini is a senior associate in the practice group. He works very closely with Ross and likewise is um, a very skilled practitioner, a litigator, an advisor, and you know, works closely um, on these matters that we are gonna be talking about today. So let's jump right into it. On Monday, the 28th of February, the Minister of Labor, um, well, Minister of Employment and Labor published the National Draft Migration Policy and the Human Services Amendment Bill. This is published for public comment and comments on the policy and the bill can be sent to an email address dedicated to this issue, nlmp at labor.gov.za by the 29th of May. So if any of you have any um, representations to be made, please make use of this facility. Um, it is open only for another month and a couple of days, so please do so. And also be in touch with us if you would like us to assist in that regard. So where does this all come from? We have an interesting context. From an economic growth and employment perspective, we face many challenges. We have a terribly high unemployment rate. Our youth unemployment is at record highs. We are plagued by intolerance and violence directed at foreign laborers and workers. Our skilled workers are mobile and the global war for talent taps our skilled resources. We know this, we talk often about the brain drain. And it is in this context that the Department of Employment and Labor is now seeking to introduce amendments to the Employment Services Act, particularly insofar as the employment of foreigners is concerned. And it then published this policy and these amendments to the Employment Services Act in, in a bill form. So to understand these amendments, it is perhaps good to first understand the current position. Why, you know, what is the gap that we are trying to fill here? So Ross, if you can perhaps explain from an employment perspective, what pieces of legislation we have and how these provide protection to workers, including foreign workers. Thank you, Talita. Um, good morning, everyone. All right, well, as you're all aware, we've got the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. This act provides for minimum conditions of employment. In addition to the BCA, there are also sectoral determinations. So, for example, there is the retail and wholesale determination. There is the domestic workers determination. 
just among, um, uh, just to name a few. Um, and then we've also got collective um, bargaining agreements um, at, you know, industry level. So there's the Road Freight Bargaining Council Agreement, there is the Metal and Indian Engineering Industries Agreement. So all of these agreements provide a framework for identifying minimum conditions of service for employees. Uh, then, of course, there's the Labor Relations Act. The Labor Relations Act protects um, employees, including foreign workers, against unfair labor practices and unfair dismissals. Then there is the Employment Equity Act, which protects against unfair discrimination. There are the Skills Development Act and the Skills Development Levies Act, which provides for um, skills development and for um, training of employees. And then, of course, there's the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which looks after health and safety of workers or employees in the workplace. And from the immigration perspective, how, does, how do things work as of now? Thank, thanks very much, uh, Talita. My apologies for, for joining us um, a bit belatedly. Um, from the immigration perspective, there, there are two... Um, uh, my, again, my apologies. <laughs> um, there are two key uh, bits of legislation. We've got the Immigration Act, and the uh, distinct from that, we have the earlier Refugees Act. Um, the, the legislation draws a, a distinction between the, there's an important distinction between the, the rights and duties of, let's call it the average foreign national in the country and what he or she is allowed to do and what he or she needs permission to do on the one hand and refugees and asylum seekers on the other hand who become a, a special class of, of foreign nationals in the country. But even the, the, the Immigration Act creates a, um, uh, several important distinctions so that, there, again, there are special types, special classes of, of foreign nationals. So it, it's, it's important to bear in mind that whilst um, there's a, um, a rather ill-defined uh, set of rules as to what um, or, or when a foreign national needs permission and to do what? Uh, you know, we we we've uh, um, to the to the extent that permission is needed, um, the Immigration Act provides for uh, you know visas and permits to be issued that will authorize the foreign national to undertake those tasks. Um, and it's important also to, to in terms of our, our wider context here, that the Immigration Act, which was uh, dates back to 2002, um, has a very important preamble which sets out its, its uh, let's call it the parameters of the Immigration Act, which include ensuring that economic growth is promoted through, uh, so I'm reading from it, through the employment of needed foreign labor, through foreign, and that foreign investment is facilitated that the entry of exceptionally skilled or qualified people is enabled, uh, skilled human resources is increased, and that there's academic exchanges and so on. And although the, the Immigration Act has been amended three or four times since 2002, this preamble and, and, and the, kind of the, the, the function of home affairs in the, the let's call it the, the mix between labor and immigration remains unchanged. Anyway, so that, that, that's a very, a very kind of hurried dash through the, 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 the immigration legislation. Talita, I think you're on mute. My apologies. Thanks, Awadi. Chris, it does seem that there is a, 
an overlap, especially when it comes to foreigners between the Department of Labor and the Department of Home Affairs domains. Um, do these departments work together? Do they, you know, inform each other's policies or, you know, how does it work on a, on a practical level? Um, it's it's gone through sort of various iterations over the over the years. In terms of the the Immigration Act, um, the uh, Minister of well, I mean, Parliament approved or set up a what's called an, the the Immigration Advisory Board, um, which is which is still in place, which serves to advise the minister on any issue of immigration and immigration related issues that the, the, the minister requires. And um, in the uh, one of one of the amendments, um, so I can't remember which one, but the, the the membership requirements were kind of booted up from uh, requiring chief directors from various departments it was increased to director general level or at worst deputy director general level. So it's supposed to be, that, that is supposed to be the, uh, the, the venue or the forum in which um, various government departments can participate and other stakeholders, it's not just uh, government. So, um, I mean, and this has been in place since yeah, 2002 and, um, but as I say, it's, it has kind of f f the the immigration advisory board has kind of fallen in and out of favour um, over over the years, and I'm you know, I'm advised at the moment it's it's largely moribund. But um, the, the the point is that the platform is there for uh, the, the vehicle is there for consultation across uh, the departments and across the economy. Thanks, Chris. So, Wadi, one of the things that really warms my heart um, is reading about the brain gain in the policy. And that is one of the key, um, well, um, priorities that South Africa needs to facilitate. Um, what are the plans in this regard? Does this say? Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks, Talita. I think. You know, the starting point is to say that the policy itself, right, is a product of collabor collaboration between the Department of Labor and the Department of Home Affairs. And essentially, the purpose of the policy is to identify, you know, effective measures of regulating labor migration. Right. Now, there's two, among others, there's two primary considerations, you know, that the policy looks at in trying to effectively um, regulate labor migration. The first consideration is, again, what you've referred to as this brain gain concept, right? Or, you know, the, the appreciation that South Africa will benefit um, by attracting, um, you know, foreign workers or, you know, foreign workers with particular skills, right? So that's the first consideration. And the second consideration, of course, is balancing the attraction of foreign skills with you know avoiding a situation where you're stifling local employment um, and you sort of you know not you're appointing you know foreign you know individuals in in positions which can be occupied by local employees so these are the two things that the policy trying to try to to balance right but in regard to the brain gain you know issue and attracting you know foreign skills one of the plans one of the measures are put into place is you know trying to create you know incentives um, of attracting these foreign skills um, you know the policy talks about proactively you know recruiting skilled workers from you know foreign um, countries um, and essentially making south africa an attractive environment um, to again attract these foreign skills right so that's you know the brain gain and how we try to facilitate and we try to uh, you know uh, attract foreign skills but as you know um you know the policy does more than that right um and you know what it does is it tries to prioritize you know certain things to achieve 
you know, this balance and to effectively, um, you know, regulate the labor migration. One of the things that it prioritizes is, you know, this new concept of imposing quotas uh, to limit the number of foreign, you know, employees that can be employed. Again, the idea is to try and protect South African, uh, you know, citizens or local uh, employees, um, you know, from, you know, an influx of foreign employment, right? Another thing that they, you know, it tries to prioritize, Talita, is, you know, this concept of critical skills, right? So we want to attract foreign skills, particularly where people can occupy these critical skills, right? Um, and again, we try and make it attractive. We try to have these incentives. We try to, you know, encourage people to come through um, and be employed this side. Um, and what goes to that again is, you know, regulating the employment conditions and the social protection um, of these employees. Again, making sure that the conditions, you know, you know, are, are improved and are attractive for them, both on an employment scale and on a social scale. The body, um, when we hear the word quotas, we get nervous. <laughs> is that something that is going to apply to to all employers that are um, trying to uh, employ foreigners, or what is the proposal in relation to quotas? And Ross, please jump in if, if yeah. you want to add. Yeah. No, thanks, Lita. So, look, the idea really is, you know, to regulate or to try and regulate the number of foreign employees coming into the country. One of the propositions, um, you know, is that the minister will, you know, draft or prepare a notice. And in this notice, you know, the minister will specify, you know, the category of, you know, employees or the category of sectors or positions uh, where the quota will apply, right? We also understand there's situations where you know, the quota will not apply in the certain instances where somebody will be exempt. Uh, and one of the you know, instances is where um, you know, the, the policy and the draft amendment bill speaks about um, uh, small employees. Again, it doesn't define what small employees is, but the notice itself will define that. Um, and again, those small em uh, employers rather will um, you know, be exempt from application of the quota uh, system. Um, and we also know that the quota won't apply in circumstances where the foreign individual, right, is occupying a critical skill, right? Um, so again, if it's a critical skill, it goes back to trying to attract people to come and be employed um, into South Africa and making us attractive to them. So if there's a critical skill that the foreign foreigner is, is occupying, it won't apply in that instance. And the last point is there are also circumstances where an employer can apply uh, to be exempt from application of the, the, the quota. Um, so really, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the quota and the circumstances in which you know, an employer or an employee will be exempt from um, you know, the application of the quota system. And can I just jump in there? Um, so it's not really on, on quotas, but what the um, policy and the amendment seem to envisage is where there are critical skills and then there are exemptions applied because of those critical skills, the employer has a significant obligation to then ensure that the, the foreign employee with these critical skills trains and develops South Africans. So it's all about passing on those skills in order to um, develop the South Africans so that they can actually fill those positions um, going forward. So I think there's, um, there's a twofold reason for, for that, that exemption. Um, can, yeah, can, can I, uh, yeah, at this point, also just jump in. I'm, the, I'm concerned about the, I, I think my sense when I when I read the the the, uh, the draft policy was that um, yeah in, in principle the idea is good you know the, so if we're looking at creating a, a system where visas and permits um, are are issued 
um, for example, on the basis of um, accurate real-time information and based on sound and sustainable policies. The, uh, the overall idea is good, but you know, all too often, um, the, the, as they say in the classics, the, the devil was in the detail with these things. Um, you know, we talk about you know, exemptions are possible and, and uh, you know, one can apply to the minister for relief here and, and so on. And <clears throat> at two comments there, one is that the, the, the draft policy um, makes the, the it's in, in this context of how important the nuts and bolts are, uh, you know, you've, you've got a draft policy of uh, about 110, 120 pages. And it, it allocates three lines to one of the most important bits, which is that we need to improve efficiencies. You know, for, for example, right now, um, if, you, if you apply for a work visa, for, for a general, if you move away from the critical skills visa, if you apply for a general work visa, you, which is mean that you don't have a critical skill, um, the, the waiting time you, you have to apply to the Department of Labor for permission to, to employ the foreign national. <clears throat> and currently the waiting time is anything between nine and 12 months um, to get labor to, to come up with an assessment. Um, now, in, in the real world, businesses can't wait nine or 12 months. You, 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 and and you know, would-be employees can't wait nine or 12 months. To see, you know, am I going to be employed? Am I going to move myself and my family from, argument sake, Finland to South Africa? Um, and so there's there's a kind of an un, there's a there's a uh, uh, um, I, I think there's a challenge there because, as I say, the act doesn't say how they're going to do it. And, oh, the, sorry, the, the the policy doesn't say how this is going to be achieved. Um, and I think also on the um, uh, on on the on the side of you know how this is on the aspect of how this is going to be implemented, um, this th th this much of this draft policy was being debated to in twenty years ago. Um, I sat on that uh, immigration advisory board of the ministers literally in two thousand and two two thousand and three for three or four years. And we went through exactly this exercise. Um, the, the only thing that was left out was the issue of quotas for, for, for businesses. But everything else is, is almost, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but almost word for word for what we were debating 20 years ago. And it didn't come to fruition at the time um, because there was, and I think that was because there was an unrealistic, uh, uh, um, regard wasn't had to what this was going to cost government um and it just kind of you know like so much rain in the desert it just kind of trickled away um so i, I think there's there's a to say while the idea is some of the ideas are good implementation is is i think for a lot of companies uh it's you know how is this going to work and it, you know can it be better than what we have at the moment? And I'm, I'm worried that we've, we've, um, we're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're kind of moving the function from the oversight from home affairs to labor. And um, th there's no reason why this needs to be done. Um, so I, I, as I say, and so little is said in the, in the actual document about um, how, are we, how are we going to uh, um, improve efficiencies? It's going to require more staff. It's going to require more training. It's going to require more IT systems. Um, somewhat famously, if I can uh, qu quote him, one of the uh, senior deputy director generals in, at Home Affairs complained years ago that he's never been able to get the money to have the IT systems that they need for a proper uh, visa and permit system in this country. It just, the money just isn't there. And that was before COVID. Um, uh, he also you know, said to me in, in, in one, one discussion that, um, uh, that the Home Office in the UK has more inspectors at Heathrow than he has in the country. 
you know, and the again in a in a post COVID world where, but, where department budgets have been stripped, uh, I just can't see how 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 this is actually going to see the light of day. And I think representations um, need to kind of tackle the practicalities. You know, how is this going to look in in in, in practice? Because I, I, I I'm yes I'm I'm worried about the practicality of the policy. Yeah. And it seems, Chris, that there is going to be um, two regimes now, or is the idea to amend the Immigration Act now or to, to take all of those principles in relation to what the employer needs to prove um, out of the Immigration Act in the, the Employment Services Bill? Because one of of the things I noticed is that in the event that you want to employ a foreigner, you need to show that there is no South African who can perform that work. Um, that is just a blanket statement. Um, whilst there is a, a very you know, detailed, um, nuanced approach under the Immigration Act in relation to a variety of visas that a foreigner might qualify. Um, yeah, the well, again, a couple of issues there. The the um, the whole issue of the kind of let's call it the interdepartmental um, uh, poly, uh, let's call it interface um, is is not not explained. Um, and I, you know, as I can say anecdotally, uh, official, some officials in some of the, the departments mentioned in the draft policy were either blissfully unaware of this policy, that they, they, they were not consulted, um, or uh, as one, one senior official in one of the departments said to me, they had made representations, but they were clearly ignored. Um, so how this is gonna play out politically is going to be um, um, something to watch uh, very, 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 very closely. Because it seems that the, the, the purpose the kind of the, the overall purpose or intent, uh, strategic direction of the um, of the policy paper is to kind of strip down home affairs to a kind of a bare minimum of you know you will issue visas, you will issue passports, you will issue IDs based on labour making the assessments of who should be uh, um, who, who's who does the economy need um, and its assessments. Which brings us on to the issue of the, the you know, for example, the critical skills visa. And, um, you know, one of the, 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 uh, the new list of critical skills that were published at the beginning of February um, highlights, I think, some, some uh, short, I mean, shortcomings that have plagued previous lists. And that is the, the issue of consultation. Um, you know, for example, doctors are, are are on the list. Our doctors were on the list, and our doctors are taken off the list. And we are told that this was because the, um, we, we had all these uh, young graduates from Cuba and China and Tunisia and wherever else who find themselves unable to um, uh, get into the profession because we had foreign doctors um, holding holding positions, but. Essentially, the, the, the shortcoming is that the, the assumption is that these are all entry level positions. But if, if you're, for example, if you're a, a senior um, pediatric pulmonologist and, and you want to come and, uh, and do some charitable work, you, you want to move to South Africa and you want to work in the Eastern Cape, for example, we will battle to get a work visa. It will be almost impossible to get a work visa for that, for that person. So we don't have a, a kind of a, a, a sense of, uh, we don't draw a distinction in the critical skills list of seniority. It's, it's, I mean, if we can turn to our own field, um, you know, with the emergence of, of oil and gas, for example, that's not taught in South African universities. We, and and our, our clients need senior level advice, but, um, lawyers aren't allowed. Lawyers you know, getting permission to, to to bring in a foreign lawyer is is uh, next to impossible. Um, so there's a problem around the consultation and the, the the extent of consultation in the critical skills uh, current critical skills list, 
And there are a lot of politics that go into you know, the constitution of the, of the, the current list. So I think it's, it's um, we, again, we have, we, we have challenges here. Thanks. Can I just jump in there, Chris? From, from what I'm hearing, it seems very much um, that, um, that, that, that companies that need critical skills or that require um, foreign, uh, um, foreign employees um, because of seniority, because of their skills, um, experience, um, that they need to give very, very careful thought to this draft policy and to the amendments, uh, the amendments bill um, in, in order that they can make appropriate and proper representations um, on these sorts of issues. So at least their, their specific concerns are before the decision makers. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, very, very much so. I mean, I, one of the the uh, Zawadi raised the issue of um, you know the, the how the the draft policy, for example, applauds the um, um, and will encourage kind of brain gain development, um, but the. <laughs> The, the kind of, it, it's, it's almost a schizophrenic reality here. Um, because for, for me, for example, I mean, again, this came up, <laughs> I hate to say it, 20 years ago. Um, if you take the case, for example, of international students uh, studying in South Africa, they're all paying premium fees to the universities. So South Africa does not subsidize them at all. So we've got these guys coming in, paying full fees at universities, and what happens at the end of their um, uh, the end of their, their, their degrees? These are guys who have come here, they've studied, many of them want to stay on. We haven't paid a penny for the, we, we've gained, the universities earn a fortune out of the international students. And do we then try and, shouldn't we rather, I suppose the question, shouldn't we try and, and lay a basis for saying, right, seeing as you've, you've, kind of, you've, you've been here, you've got, uh, um, you, kind of, you fit into this African environment and we haven't paid for your skill. We haven't paid a penny for your skills. Let's, let's kind of ease you into, let's, let's provide some kind of uh, quicker way into the South African economy, into the job market. Um, there was, in fact, a, and again, the, the, until uh, February, there was a dispensation that, that provided that if, if you had qualified in South Africa and your skill, in fact, was on the critical skills list, there was a fast track into the system. And the, the, the minister has cancelled that. So on the one, side, one hand, we're saying, yes, we want brain gain. Uh, we, we want to kind of get these quick fixes, but we, we've, we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot in, in the same breath. And I think the, the, the other aspect um, is that I, the, the, there seems to be um, a little appreciation in the draft policy for the fact that we're not an A-list destination. If, you, if you're a senior software developer and you've got an offer of employment from Canada or the States and South Africa, where are you going to go to? <laughs> you know, I love my country, but sometimes we, you know, we're, just, we're, we're not the, the, this kind of primary destination. And so companies need to be able to, uh, we, we need to be able to offer more. I mean, for example, if you take the Middle East, uh, there are, I mean, it's not always an environment that people want to move to, but the 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 the, um, um, the kind of the Home Affairs administrations there move heaven and earth to make sure visas are issued quickly, and that there's, there are, there are other measures in place. For example, that spouses will be allowed to 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 work, etc. And other countries, you know, I hate to say it, but Mauritius, for example, um, uh, Namibia and others are trying to, are kind of making strides in that sense of saying, of, of realizing we need to step up. We, 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 we are not America. We are not the, well, I don't know if one would make the UK an A-list anymore, but, you know, uh, uh, without the politics of it, um, 
the, the, the policy needs to have that more nuanced approach. And again, I think this is for, for the, the, the stakeholders, for the employers to say, um, but these are the problems we are having. I must also just mention that the, the, there's also an initiative at the moment, um, and, it's, and it's been uh, uh, formally announced within the presidency, where the president has had appointed the former Director General of Home Affairs, Mabusu Simang, uh, to come up with an action plan to uh, you know, kind of improve the immigration system. And uh, Mr. Msimang, I know, is, is, has got a very wide mandate and is working very, very hard on this issue. And now suddenly we have this, this uh, uh, draft migration policy, which anticipates essentially moving a lot of that functionality out of home affairs and into labor. So they say we seem to have this, this, this kind of disparity, this kind of almost schizophrenic uh, challenge, which again, from a business perspective, you almost want to ask, okay, who's in charge? Uh, who who really pulls the strings here? Um, and you know, who are we really talking to? And, you know, and as as business, we need certainty in our lives on a on a day to day basis. So uh, it's it's I I think as again, the it's important that representations stop, keep banging the drum, but it's important that the the practical realities the business face on a day to day basis need to be conveyed to um, uh, to, the, to the, the stakeholders or to the, the, the department. So Ross, if we listen to all this, where is this bill coming from? What, why do we have it? You know, don't we have enough legislation as it is? That's a very good question, Salisa. Look, when you consider, uh, certainly from the employment law perspective, um, I think we do have enough legislation. I mean, it seems to be that the aim of the bill is to facilitate the employment of foreigners, but also to regulate. So there is a lot of talk in the, in the, the, the policy and the, in, in the bill about protection of foreigners. Um, and that when there is a worker, they, they need to be protected from unfair labor practices, from unfair employment, um, you know, a lot of the, the, the foreign workers we see in the country are your vulnerable, unskilled, unskilled workers. So there does seem to be a focus on trying to protect them. But as we discussed at the beginning, um, you know, we've got the VCEA, we've got sectoral determinations, the Labor Relations Act, the, um, the, the Employment Equity Act, all of those acts. Insofar as there's skills development and passing on skills, that's also covered for in the Skills Development Act. So... Um, I do think that we've, we've probably got a sufficient framework and it seems to me that it might be that that framework needs to be more carefully monitored as opposed to introducing something new. Um, but then as, as Chris said, from the immigration perspective, that's also all covered in the Immigration Act and the regulations. Um, but I do think that at this stage, uh, you know, we're all aware there's, um, as you said, there's huge unemployment in the country. It is causing significant concern. I think it's putting a lot of pressure on the Department of Employment and Labor. Um, I also think that there is a huge concern about these xenophobic attacks. And um, I, I feel that, that the department is looking for ways to address these issues, wants to be seen to be taking action to, to try and bring some, some certainty, some stability in the economy. Uh, that's me reading between the lines. Whether this will achieve what they're seeking to achieve, um, as I say, I think we've, we've got the laws in place already. So um, I, th I think more, um, you know, monitoring those laws, taking more active steps to, to, um, to see how, how workers and employees are being treated that would probably be a bit of uh, a better um, way to 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 offer those protections. What is your so, sense? Sorry, so Tanita, sorry. can I just, just yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the almost the elephant in the in the middle of the lounge, the proverbial elephant in the middle of the lounge here, is that again to come back to the the, the whole issue of. I mean, there is this recognition on the one hand that we need, we need, companies need skills. 
I'm not sure, however, that there's been a, a uh, it's called as thorough an analysis of the of who is unemployed in the South African uh, uh, economy. Um, and certainly anecdotally, the, the, the suspicion has to be that it's largely at, at, at the entry level. Um, so one of the fixes that, that they're proposing, which we, we, we have alluded to previously, um, has been this idea that every, for, every company has to have a, a skills transfer plan in place um, in terms of which any foreign, also every foreign national in their employ must be transferring skills to, uh, to, uh, to South Africans. Um, <clears throat> which, sorry, it, is, it actually just meant raises an issue I'd, I'd forgotten. That we've got this, the, the, the draft bill has different definitions um, of, you know, who is a South African to the immigration legislation. And that's going to be a problem in, 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 in terms of, uh, for example, the, the, the quota system, because you can't just paint foreign nationals as uh, all being, you know, everyone, you know, all foreign nationals are the same. Now, I was saying at the outset that, for example, in terms of international conventions, we have to treat asylum seekers and uh, refugees as a, protected class of foreign nationals. So, I mean, if a company is employing a, a person who's a foreign national or a, or a refugee, in terms of international convention, they're supposed to enjoy the rights of permanent residents. Um, so, but a permanent resident, you know, is still a foreign national. So, you know, are, are, we, are we still going to require the company to effectively find a replacement for the, the, the refugee or the asylum seeker. Um, a related problem in the Immigration Act, for example, is the, uh, the, 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 the situation of spouses of South Africans and spouses of South African permanent residents. The Constitutional Court has, uh, on, on uh, two occasions, uh, read the, 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 sort of the Right Act to Home Affairs that spouses of South Africans are again a protected class of foreign nationals in South Africa, in South Africa and that um, they have to be allowed to kind of enter the job market without restriction because their primary duty, the, the, the duty they, so the South African spouse is entitled to look to his or her foreign partner to contribute to the, the family income, to the family purse. And it's not about the, the, the position of, of the, the state of the economy and how many South Africans are, are employed or unemployed. So again, that kind of nuanced approach is, is, is missing from the, the, um, um, uh, the draft bill and, and the policy. And I think, again, that's something that needs to be, be tackled in representations. But to come back to the skills transfer plan, um, you know, I've, I've used the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the example in, in other discussions where, you know, if, if one were to, you know, if, for example, a South African football team was to uh, recruit on, on loan some legendary soccer player, you know, Lionel Messi or, you know, someone of that ilk for four years. The theory is, in terms of the school's transfer plan, that that soccer team would now have an, a, a clone of Lionel Messi uh, playing for them, which doesn't happen in HR reality. It depends on, you know, who are you training? Are they trainable? Um, is the trainer a decent trainer? Um, you know, or, or what if the person you're training decides to go off and join another soccer team or gets transferred overseas or something? So again, the, the theory is, is, is sound in the sense of, yes, it's a good idea to get the foreign national to pass on skills, but are all foreign nationals the same? And can the skills transfer idea really work in practice? We have had cases over the years of companies who've spent a fortune uh, kind of training up new CFOs or CEOs 
based on on the, the the people they were on the, the foreign nationals passing on skills and um you know suddenly the guy gets poached by you know a competitor and the company is sitting looking well we've, we've invested all this money and time in this the skills transfer scheme and now we're back, we're back to to square one and now we need we actually need this guy back in town to to restart the process you know and home affairs will be less than impressed so it, it, as i say it's the idea is good but it, it, the the reality is is way more nuanced well i know that zawadi will be delighted if lionel messi would come to south africa <laughs> and <laughs> I think we will have a brain drain from moments. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll draft the transfer plan myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Wadi, but do you think that um, the quota system would cause more South Africans to get jobs? Is there, you know, can one say because they're limiting foreigners from coming into the country that more South Africans will get jobs? Can one make that causal link? Yeah, Talita, it's, it's hard to say because, you know, I mean, the rationale of the quota system is to say, okay, you know, we're putting a max on the number of people who can, you know, come from foreign countries and be employed here, right? But that's also, you know, presuming or assuming that there are people in South Africa who can occupy those positions, right? So it's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, so it, it has to, in my mind, if we're going to achieve job creation, it has to go to number one, um, empowering people to occupy those positions, right? And local um, you know, employees. And then number two, obviously, you know, imposing this, this quota, which, has in my mind you know good intentions but i think the problem with the policy doesn't really speak to how we're going to empower local people what you're saying is okay there's a cap on how many people can come into the country but, but then what happens then so those those are the problems i identified Lisa. and can i just jump in there one of the things that strikes me um when you're looking at the quota system and when you're looking at the requirement that employers must make sure that there's no one else in South Africa with the skills to perform the, the function. Um, but it doesn't take into account that, you know, there might be people in South Africa with the skills, but they might be gainfully employed elsewhere. They might not be interested in taking up the position that the company is offering, and they might simply not be available. And I think those are all issues that probably need to be, uh, need to be addressed because um, I don't think that the, 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 the policy or the draft policy and the bill actually addresses those. They sort of give the exceptions, they give the limits, but they don't look beyond that and what happens in such a scenario. If I can add, oh, can I, yeah, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Chris, yeah, I, <laughs> sorry, Chris, uh, um, beat you to it there. Um, no, just to add on to that, Roz, you know, and, and Chris, he spoke to it as well, the situation that we find ourselves in, which is the fact that, you know, South Africa isn't the most attractive environment, and that's a double-edged sword, right? So we're going to struggle in attracting foreign employees, but at the same time, we're having a significant rise in local employees moving abroad, right? Um, and the policy tries to, you know, at least address that but in my mind it's quite ambitious and it doesn't really have practical measures of addressing it so for example one of the things it tries to do to retain you know this you know local talent and you know avoid them from going across is you know saying look we want to be involved in the whole process uh, so we want to ensure that if you want to go abroad as a local citizen we want to support you and we want to to the extent possible, place you in these different, pla in these different places. Um, and the idea is if we're in part of that process, we can then also incentivize you to come back, um, which again, I don't know how practical that might be again, because South Africa isn't as attractive as other jurisdictions. Um, and there aren't express and practical, I suppose, measures in the policy to ensure that 
you know, once people do leave the country, how do we ensure that they come back with, you know, with what I imagine skills that they've attained elsewhere? Um, but yeah, just to, that was what I wanted to add on to what you were saying. Mark. So, yeah, can I just, yeah, so the, um, what I had was actually a question to, to the other panelists, which is, um, is, do, do they think, do you guys think that the, this idea of quotas for, you know, it, it, um, trying to force, trying to compel businesses to have a, um, uh, uh, yeah, a, a minimum number or a maximum number of foreign nationals having these, these, these caps, etc. Would this actually pass constitutional muster? Um, is, is it, you know, are businesses protected by the constitution in this respect? Um, would this be, yeah, would it be constitutional? Chris, that's a very good question to which I don't have an off the, <laughs> off the cuff answer. Um, so yeah, it's something I think we will need to apply our minds to. Um, T uh, Zawadi, I'm not certain if you have any views. I'm not the moment. Constitution guarantees the right of everyone to practice their trade. Um, it says everyone. So it also include juristic persons, my businesses. Um, and yeah, you raise a fascinating question, Chris, because one can easily see that businesses might say you are, you know, unfairly limiting our ability to practice our trade, by imposing these kinds of limitations. Of course, no right is absolute, so you would need to you know, see how this right is being limited, and is it by way of a law of general application? Is it proportionate to the, the the goal that you are achieving but certainly you know there is a there's an argument to be made there so Adi sure I have to burn the midnight oil on this one actually <laughs> um, oh. but yeah yeah Ross, if I can come back to you and the amendments to the Employment Services Act now this Act was enacted on Women's Day in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, the, all of the regulations contemplated in that act are still in the draft form. None are actually published yet. And if we look at um, what is proposed now, it seems that there's quite a list of things that are also going to be dealt with in regulation. So if you can perhaps take us through those. My question is, is, you know, do we even know? If, because all of this is in, in the regulation. So I suppose this, the starting point in that question is just to look at what the Employment Services Act seeks to do insofar as foreign workers are concerned. Um, and what it includes is the facilitation of the employment of foreign nationals in the South African economy where their contribution is needed. So that's the first thing that the, um, the act as it stands provides. And the, it then goes on to say that when, when foreign workers are employed um, because they are needed, then they have the right to um, fair labor practices to be protected in terms of section 23 of the constitution. But the Act goes further to say this also make, needs to make sure that this does not impact adversely or negatively on existing labour standards or the rights and expectations of South African workers. Um, and then it's also about the training of or the promotion of training of South African citizens and permanent residents. But the difficulty comes in because there are no, the, the regulations haven't come into force. There is no guidance on how this is done. So the bill now seeks to extend the scope. And it's now looking at not only the facilitation of the employment of, of foreign workers, but also the regulation. And it seems to be now coming in far more or, or Labor seems to, the Department of Labor seems to be more intent on taking a more active 
role in monitoring it. And it comes to what Chris was saying earlier about, you know, the role of, uh, of, the, of home affairs versus the role of employment and labor. Um, and it certainly seems that um, the, the, the Department of Employment and Labor is seeking to get more involved, to take over a lot of the responsibilities of the Department of, of Home Affairs. And so what the bill envisages is that it's there to ensure that foreign nationals are entitled to work in South Africa and to, uh, to perform the work that they're employed for, um, but that before recruiting a foreign national, the company must take steps to satisfy themselves that there is no one in South Africa other than foreign nationals who can perform that um, that that position or who have the requisite skills, which goes back to the um, the, the the point we were discussing earlier. Um, the um, employer is also then required to prepare a skills transfer plan in respect of any position in which a foreign national is employed. But as Chris has already said, it's unclear what that's going to be and how that's going to actually um, you know take sh shape and what employers need to do uh, and what it means for employers. Um, and then it also requires that foreign nationals must be employed on terms and conditions that are not inferior to those provided South African citizens. Um, and then it's retention of documents to show that if you employ a foreigner, you have um, the, the, requisite, um, the, the requisite skills. So those are the aims. But once again, until the regulations come in, until there is direction, um, I'm not certain to what extent these will be enforceable or to what extent companies will be able to practically take the steps needed. I mean, just for example, before recruiting a foreign national, you must, you must satisfy yourself there's no one else in the country that has the requisite skills. I mean, what does that entail? What are your obligations? Is it sufficient to go to an employment services um, um, consultant and ask them if there's anyone? I mean, exactly what, what does it entail? Are you required to go to the universities and see what, it, you know, what degrees are being, um, um, what degrees are being awarded to, to, to uh, prospective employees? So it is unclear to me at this stage how this is going to be monitored, how it's going to be enforced. And absent regulations, I'm not certain this is going to take, take us any further. Uh, Talita, just following on what Roz was saying, you know, it, um, there's also the, the perspective that, um, you know, as, uh, the, the draft bill says that employers must uh, ensure that no South as, as a yeah no South African is is available for the position. But where does this leave employers? Where, for example, that yes, there is a, a candidate with qualifications, but he or she has, for our argument's sake, uh, cr a criminal record, um, or he or she is one of those persons that you do not want near your office. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> we've, I think we've all seen those people, you know, you, you say, whoa, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't need that in my office. Um, again, that, that's, that doesn't seem to be an option allowed to, to, to the employer um, to say, um, yes, you're, you're an unemployed South African, but you are, a, uh, you know, you have an unfortunate track record um, in in uh, in business, and we, we don't want you around. Um, and it also raises, I mean, this idea of we don't want there to be an underclass, as it were, of uh, for the foreign nationals with with fewer rights than than South African workers, which kind of begs the question of, you know, for example, we have the ongoing crisis of or well, ongoing situation of. The, the, the quarter of a million Zimbabweans or more in the country at the moment that um, are kind of on notice to get out of town by the, by the end of the year, either to get work, apply for a work visa or, um, to, yeah, or to get out of town. Now, if, if this were to happen to a South African, in other words, you've got South Africans who are, per, you know, if you were a, a permanently employed South African and your employer is told uh, we're going to have to advertise the person, find somebody else to fill your your position. That wouldn't be that wouldn't be right. But because we're Zimbabwean, um, it's now perfectly all right. 
so it's the same and on the one hand uh it, it's we're, we're 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 saying yes we can't afford to have foreign nationals with fewer rights but you know uh, as the as you know the 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 whole situation with the Zimbabweans is saying something else can i just jump in there i mean there was a whole debate some years ago about the employment um, of foreign nationals who don't have the requisite visas. So we see it frequently where an employer has a foreign national who has a visa they're taken on, but for whatever reason, they're not put on a fixed term contract. The person's uh, work permit or, or, or visa expires and they're no longer required or entitled to work in the country. Now, what the Labor, um, the labor Court has said is those employees are still entitled to a fair hearing before their employer simply terminates their employment. So what the employer then has to do is have a, a some form of inquiry where they go sit with the employee and say, look, you know, your, your visas come to an end. We can't lawfully employ you. Um, but before we take a decision to dismiss you, you know, give us your thoughts, make representations or whatever. But practically, Although there's this right to, fair, to a fair procedure, it doesn't really give any protection because at the end of the day, you listen to what the employee says and then you say, oh, well, I've heard you, um, but you know what, I still can't employ you. So it's in my view, it's always been paying lip service to the rights of foreign workers not to be unfairly dismissed um, or to have a fair procedure before being dismissed and you know this is one of the challenges and chris i think your point is 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 a good one i mean what happens with all these um zimbabweans who come the end of the year um are likely to lose their jobs because um they they, they no longer have a uh an exemption permit um another thing i just wanted to pick up on what on, on what chris was saying is um, Chris, your point about um, the desirability of employing, um, you know, someone in South Africa um, who might have the skills, um, because what, you know, your point is, is, is very, very, um, is very correct, um, that employers have the right to determine what standard of conduct and what standard of performance they require of employees. Now, if you have a limited um, pool of South Africans with the requisite school, uh, skills, then is that not impacting on an you know employer's rights? Because at the end of the day, if those employees do not have, um, you know, do not conduct themselves correctly or do not meet your performance standard, what does that mean? Does it mean that you then um, have to do without that you you know you you as a company exercise your right to dismiss them for poor, um, poor performance or for misconduct, but then you can't employ anyone else because the pool of employees is so small. So these are all things that um, I think employers need to be considering and need to be making representations to um, to the department uh, um, you know on. I'm having a look at the Q&A and there is a question for Ms. Awadi um, in relation to critical skills and whether the bill makes provision for uh, a list of critical skills already. Yeah, yeah, no. So, I mean, the simple answer is no, um, uh, Salita. So what the, the, what the bill does and also what the policy is, it makes provision for you know, a uh, critical skills list to be published annually, right? So that's the idea. And then that list will obviously have um, the identified critical skills. Um, so at the moment, there isn't a, a definition for uh, critical skills. And then also this balance between critical skill and vulnerable employees. The policy yeah. about vulnerable sectors can you perhaps give us some guidance in that regard sure so you know the policy identifies you know a couple of sectors which it it, it has identified to have you know experienced a considerable amount of abuse and exploitation um and the sectors include construction um domestic work and cleaning services farming hospitality mining security and entertainment right and the 
understanding or the idea that the policy is trying to introduce is that, you know, the Department of Labor, together with the Department of Home Affairs, need to understand why these are vulnerable, um, you know, uh, sectors, but also ensure that they're adequately protected because of, you know, the historic vulnerability and the historic uh, abuse and exploitation that they've been subject to. T, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, Johannes is taking us to the next topic, Ross, which is introduced by the bill. And that is of a digital labor platform. And saying that that platform is the employer. What, what do you make of that, Ross? Look, I think the, 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 the definition or the, the, the requirements in the, in the bill are potentially problematic. So before we go in, in there, I think what the bill is seeking to do is offer protection for this category of platform workers. You know, we've seen lots of cases where platform workers are claiming that they're employed, are seeking the rights of employees, where the... Um, Digital, the, 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 the digital platform is saying, but we're not your employer. You're an independent contractor and you simply provide a, a service through the platform. Um, and there's been a lot of debate and a lot of concern about the working conditions of platform workers. Um, and so I think the bill is, well, the bill is seeking to, to regulate that, is seeking to provide protections. Um, the difficulty, I think, is that it's not particularly clear what is envisaged. So the first thing is a digital labor platform is defined as an electronic entity that enables the provision of work or services by a person to another person in South Africa. So um, that is what it constitutes. So you'll look at whether it's Mr. D or Uber, Bolt, any of these, uh, and they would fall within a digital labor platform. The difficulty then comes in is that the, the bill then seeks to regulate these platforms and provides for circumstances in which the digital labor platform is an employer. Now, now what does that mean? How can an electronic entity that provides um, services be a, an employer? So I think what they're aiming at or what the intention is, that it's the company behind that. So there is, you know, there is going to be a legal entity that establishes, um, or maybe a person, but that is someone who establishes that platform. And I think the intention is that that person will be the employer if the requirements for uh, employment are met in terms of the bill. But it is unclear because at this stage, what it says is the digital platform the electronic entity is the employer. And that's where there is confusion because I don't know how you enforce rights as against an electronic entity. Yeah. And then, um, so, that, sorry, I just, I, I was just looking at Johanna's question. He said, it's sort of any company with an online presence. Yeah, I suppose arguably it could be. You've got, you know, so many companies that are now, um, you know, you have your online shopping, you have uh, online advisory services, and I suppose any of those could conceivably be or constitute an electronic entity. Um, I would suggest that the, um, that the definition is probably broad enough to encompass that, although I'm not convinced that that was necessarily the intention. Mm. Surely one would have to meet the requirements of Section 200A, the Labor Relations Act, in order to be divided as an employee. Yeah, and this is the other concern. Um, I think the, the bill now seeks to include worker. So you've got your employee in terms of Labor Relations Act, in terms of the uh, BCEA, employment equity, etc. But in terms of the National Wage Act, you've got a worker. And now in terms of this bill, they're talking about a worker. So the, the question that arises there, are we ending up with two categories of persons? Employees on the one hand who have certain rights and workers on the other who have other rights. 
it's becoming very confusing um, and it is difficult then to, to determine what test do you apply. As Talita says, um, is, 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 is the test that applies um, still the one that's set out in section 200 capital A, which identifies or um, provides for the presumption uh, as to who is an employee? Do you use your dominant um, impression test? What test do you apply? And is the bill providing rights to additional categories um, of, of persons that are not provided for in the rest of the employment legislation? Well, all that I can say, it is interesting times to be an employment lawyer <laughs> um, and to, to, run a, to run a business in these circumstances. That's a challenge. Um, uh, Johannes, I'm just going to read what you're writing here. The legal entity is the one that has the contractual relationship with the driver, and that might be a franchisee. Um, yeah, you know, what, what happens if there's no such a contractual relationship? All of these questions we, we need to get clarity on. Um, Sorry, on that note, you also have the sort of, and, and I'm, I'm now going into the sector, but in the road freight sector, for example, you've got this concept of a, an owner driver. Now, an owner driver is specifically excluded from being an employee in terms of the Road Freight Bargaining Council collective agreement. Um, so once you're an owner driver, you are an independent contractor. Now, some Uber drivers either rent their own vehicles or maybe they own their own vehicles. Now, if that is the case, taking, for example, an Uber driver, um, what does that mean? Because are they not in a similar position to an owner driver? So I think these are all questions that we're going to be grappling with and we're probably going to have to look broader into other sectors in order to start identifying, um, you know, or, 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 or seeking answers. I understand that the national health um, regulations dealing with the menace to the COVID situation has resulted in something like 150,000 representations. Um, that might be because of um, lobby groups, but that is one of the reasons why the period for comment has been extended in relation to those relations. My feeling is that there is a lot of work to be done in relation to the migration policy and also the proposed amendments to the bill. And I think where businesses have concerns and proposals to be made, they must be made. This is an opportunity that we have until the 29th of May. So yeah, I would encourage um, our participants to, to, to put in comments um, if, if they have any. Is there anything else anyone wants to add? Any, anything that comes to mind that you feel we, we still need to talk about, because I've come to the end of my list of questions. Talita, I see that there's another um, question, and I'm not certain in, in the chat group, I'm not certain if it's one we've actually covered or not, um, by Kovalin Pillay. Um, can you just have a look at that? I think it might be a question for Chris, um, but I stand to be corrected. Thanks a lot, Ross. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, yeah, Kavlin is saying a foreign national is placed by company A, which is a, com a foreign company via intercompany transfer permit to head up the South African operations. The foreign national then serves four years um, in that role and is expatriated. Company A then merges with company B, also a foreign company with a local subsidiary in South Africa. And can that foreign national now be placed in South Africa for another four years by company B. Chris, what is your take yeah. on that question? I, so, so yeah, I was trying to, to unpack the question. Um, the, 
Well, I mean, there's two questions. First of all, is there any provision for this in the proposed policy? Um, that's going to, the short answer is no. And that that's one of the kind of nuts and bolts questions I, I was alluding to. But as, as matters to answer the, the, the first question, um, you know, can the foreign national be, be brought back for another five years by company B? The answer is yes. Um, um, so a, a yes, but, um, you know, if a person has been uh, here on a four-year transfer visa, um, it is possible, the, the law doesn't disallow a second, sorry about the double negative, um, it doesn't disallow a second transfer visa being granted um, to, um, um, to a foreign national. Um, there is, however, sort of a, let's call it a, a practice-based reluctance to allow it. Um, and the, the, the usual um, rationale or the, the usual challenge we get is, you know, well, he or she has been there for four years. Why does he or she need to go back? Precisely because he or she should have transferred their skills to South Africans during that window. So poor old Lionel Messi won't be allowed to come back and join some other set soccer team. Um, but in principle, it is allowed. So what we do in these cases is we kind of uh, um, stress the importance of addressing that, that issue. You know, what happened during the first transfer? Were skills transferred? Um, uh, if not, why not? And what will what steps will be taken during the second transfer to to transfer skills? You know, uh, all skills, some skills, goal scoring skills, dribbling skills, running on the ground and paint skills. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is, it is possible. Chris Sawadi Ross, thank you very, very much for this very interesting and insightful um, discussion. We appreciate all the work you've done and um, your, all your insight. And we hope that the participants also found this very interesting and, and enlightening. Um, and we hope to see you soon again on our webinar. Thank you very much. Have a lovely Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Lita. Bye. Bye, everyone.